I'm visiting the baking capitals of the world and covering the tastes, traditions, and the recipes Look at that. of the world's best baking cities. I love coming into bakeries. From the historic streets of Palermo <laughs> to the multicultural city of San Francisco. Mm, that's lovely. Welcome to City Bakes. Today, I'm in a city at the very southern tip of Africa. I've been here before for a little bit of a break, but I've never really dug around in its baking history and what they actually produce nowadays. That is my job while I'm in this amazing city. I visit a cake shop where they don't do anything by halves. That's chocolate here, right? I meet a baker who's so passionate about teaching people to make bread, he's even making his own ovens. It's amazing. I get a taste of the latest pretender to the Krona crown. That, for me, is the future. And I try to wow the locals with my own bakes. A barbecue pie. <laughs> <laughs> and my twist on a South African classic, milk tart. Welcome to the wonderful, colourful, energising, hot Cape Town. For sun, sea, and some seriously jaw-dropping scenery, Cape Town is hard to top. It's where the Atlantic and the Indian Oceans meet, and cities don't come with much better backdrops. This is a stunner. The beautiful Table Mountain. Cape Town is South Africa's most diverse, colourful and cosmopolitan city. From its beaches to its harbours to its uber-cool bars and restaurants, it's no wonder it regularly tops poles as the best city to visit in the world. And you don't have to go on safari to spot the big five. Let me show you something that again reminds you of Cape Town. Okay. It's okay. The water are good. Very popular, ugly but cute. <laughs> <laughs> it's a bit like me. <laughs> Trade is what put Cape Town on the map 600 years ago. And over the centuries, nearly every European power staked a claim. The Portuguese arrived, then the Dutch, then the French Huguenots, then the Germans, and of course, the British came. These incomers haven't always lived peacefully side by side with the indigenous people. Apartheid rule being the worst of South Africa's modern history. But Cape Town is at the heart of a more inclusive future in what Archbishop Desmond Tutu proclaimed the Rainbow Nation. Accepting of everyone. Look at the colour of that bakery. Does that represent the Rainbow Nation? It could do. In fact, this is my first bakery where I've enlisted the help of one of South Africa's most popular celebrity chefs. Siba Mtongana. She's got her own show on the Food Network and is also a foodie TV judge. Sound familiar? I've come to meet her in District 6, a suburb just outside the city centre. Hello. Hello, Siba. How are you? You are right? How are you? Uh, nice yeah. to see you. You're nice right. to see you. What is it about Cape Town and baking? Food and baking is a thing. Specifically with baking, I mean baking, you would know, has just taken the world by storm and we are right in there. Siba wants to kick things off here at Charlie's, a bakery that takes the Rainbow Nation slogan literally and celebrates modern South Africa in uber colourful bakes. I absolutely love it. It is vibrant, it is for the young, for the old. It literally has changed the landscape. It's the brainchild of husband and wife team Charlie and Jackie Bees. Charlie, sadly, is no longer with us, but it's still very much a family affair. Daughter Daniela works here too. You can see the variety of colors of the cakes. Most definitely. Charlie trained as a master baker in Germany 
bringing traditional cake making skills, whilst Jackie's injected the colour and the fun. I came in with the crazy. No experience whatsoever in baking or decorating, except what Charlie had taught me. I need to try one of these, actually. Let's try one. I love the Amarula Ultimate Chocolate. It looks Simply great. because Amarula is such a popular liqueur that we're known for. So yeah. I'm going to have a slice of that, please. It might be packed with chocolate and South African booze, but it's the goal that makes it unmissable. That's a big slice of cake, isn't it? <laughs> we can share one. <laughs> Wow. It's a beautifully soft, moist cake that does melt in the mouth. And actually, the ganache on the outside is delicious. The amarula comes through. Yeah, I like that. <laughs> <laughs> That's a great cake. Do you like the gold? I do like the gold. <laughs> it's very blingy. It's very blingy. Yeah. Eye catching. <laughs> Sipa's next choice of cake has even more going on than the last. It's a carrot, banana, pineapple and mango cake. It's yes. got a layer of mango in the middle and it's got a cream cheese icing. Yes, please. Can I try a slice of that? Thank you. Can we please get a slice of cream? You go first. Wow. More like a carrot cake consistency. Mm. It's a rich cream cheese on the top. It's like silk. Delicious. It's a carrot cake on steroids. <laughs> This is very traditional to Cape Town. Uh, now, this is the thing with Cape Town. We look at influence with what's happening in the world, mm. and we take it in, we make it our own, and we just give it some steroids, as you said. Yeah. Or just take it to the next level. Taking their bakes to another level seems to be rather a theme here, even with a classic chocolate fudge brownie. You get a slice like this. Which gets smothered in even more chocolate. Dear me. That's ridiculous. For one almighty indulgent bake. Yeah. That's chocolatey, all right. And this place isn't just an assault on the taste buds, but on the eyes, too. I've never seen piping this colourful. For Jackie's team, anything and everything goes, and it's all done at breakneck speed. Time to unleash my arty side. I haven't piped for ages. Oh, no, see? Why don't you teach Paul a tip of starting and stopping? We start touching down and then we lift quite high up and allow it to fall. Yeah. OK. Woohoo! Go, Paul! So now I'm going to give you more colour. Yes. More colour. Some red. Yeah, I need, I need more colour than that, don't I? Some red. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> We can auction it off for charity later today. <laughs> <laughs> do you know what I need? See, my glasses. Are they really the... strong? We no, can do. Ours, but we've got oh, that's better. I bet you've never seen me so quiet. Let <laughs> me <laughs> element. I get into my art mode again. It's great. I could be here for hours. I'm no expert at piping. But I love doing them. These guys are experts. <laughs> Charlie has left this area with a greater legacy than just cakes. Just beside the bakery, he had commissioned a mural of Nelson Mandela. It seems incredible now, but in 1966, this district was declared a whites-only area. Its black residents forcibly removed to townships outside the city and their homes were flattened. But I do remember um, being in the township, because that's where I grew up, um, having what you call hippers, which are those green, big military vans, if you may call it that. It was chaos. But when I hear my father and of the stories that he used to tell me, for instance, you are not allowed to window shop. You are not allowed to do like many things that are ordinary. Being a person who lives in this time now, it's hard to fathom yeah. that that really was the reality of that time. It's truly mind-boggling and thankfully consigned to the past. The next place Sibel wants to take me is to the neighbouring Woodstock, which, unlike District 6, escaped forced removal under apartheid and remained a multi-ethnic community. It's one of the city's most vibrant neighbourhoods and, apparently, is the perfect place to lunch like a real Capetonian. I've got to show you. 
show you this place. The vibe is amazing. The food is awesome. You can't visit Cape Town and not come here. <laughs> It's always packed, but the food is great. If you're here, Seba, it's got to be cool. It is cool. The Kitchen Cafe opened in 2009. It fast became a favourite lunchtime spot for locals, city creatives, not to mention the odd celebrity. Even Michelle Obama. Look at this picture. Oh, wow. <laughs> Who that is? Yes! Wow, that is famous. <laughs> Today, it's renowned for its legendary love sandwiches. So what's in a love sandwich, then? A love sandwich will be dependent on what it is that you like. Oh, uh, right. Yeah. I thought it was just, they come up and go, da -da. I thought, oh, OK. <laughs> so you just pick whatever you want. Whatever you oh, want. Sausages. Sausages. I think I'm going to love this place. As does everyone else, it seems. It's absolutely packed. Owner Karen Dudley is doing something right. I'm Karen. Nice to meet you. Hello. Nice to meet you. But her approach to food is simple. It's got to be fresh and fun. Do you have a fork, please? Yes, we got a fork. We need a fork, please. I'd call this a whole plate of love. <laughs> They're great sausages, um, honey mustard sausages. Oh, come on. Um, the thing about South Africans, and you'll bear with me on this, we like busyness. We like where flavours are. Yeah, yeah. Engaging. Yeah. Like in Europe, they'll be like scandalous that you have so many things on your plate. It would be like, wow, oh, it's too much, it's too much. That's kind of yeah. how we are. We've kind of come to the realization this is our identity. I've fallen in love with you, Karen. <laughs> as well as a whole lot of love, Karen's also famed for her bite sized bakes. Often at lunchtime, you don't need a major, big, heavy cake. Yeah, yeah. You just want a little piece of perfection. This is the lemon square. I hope it's a good one. Yeah, it does taste really nice. <laughs> it's gooey, it's soft. I like citrus. I said, then hold on. Okay. Hold on for this piece of amazingness. I'm going to put this down then, because I'm always eating too piece much. Of amazingness. So this cake is a marriage of a few recipes that I thought of, that my lovely baker, Margie, has put together. It's kind of chiffon-y. It does look like a chiffon cake. Very rich in color. You can see all the texture. It's wobbly, look. I call it a Jaffa chiffon. Oh, yeah, it is. It's a lovely light sponge, full of orange, beautiful ganache on the top. And it is like eating a, a Jaffa cake. I thought we were very clever. Oh, she is. If Karen, her kitchen and her cakes represent modern Cape Town cooking, then I'd say it's spirited, irrepressible and packed with personality and flavour. What's not to love? Thank you very much, Karen. Thank you very much for allowing me in. Appreciate it. Such a pleasure. Take care. I hope you have a ball. Eat the whole place up. <laughs> and I've only just started in Cape Town. Next, I get a taste of the city's trendiest bake. It's lovely. It's delicious. It's really quite refreshing. And I'll show you how to make a traditional Cape Town tart with my twist. It's got a gorgeous texture of the custard. Then you have that hint of the Earl Grey as well. A bit of Britishness, a bit of Dutch, but all South African. It's another hot and sunny day in Cape Town. This morning, I want to explore the city's bread-baking past, and the most fun way to do that is to hunt down something called a bunny chow. I'm just going to find out where it is now. It's been a South African staple for decades. But don't worry, it's not made from actual bunnies. Can I order a bunny chow, please? You want a chicken, mutton, bunny chow. Mutton is something like beef, and chicken is fried chicken. OK, I'll have the fried chicken. OK. Thanks, buddy. No idea what I've just ordered. A curried meat stew of some description is served up in that hollowed-out loaf that interests me. Thank you. Thank you. It might look a bit weird, but if you think of pitta or even sandwiches, bread has been a carrier for food for centuries. And this South African loaf has a fascinating story to tell. The thing is, pre-1992, the government dominated exactly what wheat was grown, how the loaf should be made, what size it should be, what price it should be sold at. Everything was dominated by the government. The intention was good, 
to produce a low-priced loaf, a staple affordable to all. But that ultimately ended up stifling bakers' creativity and all anyone ate were these basic white loaves. This is all the people knew in South Africa and Cape Town. But the whole of Europe had moved on. Europe produced wholemeal, they produced granaries, they produced a plethora of breads which is indigenous to Italy, to Germany, to France, to Britain. Whereas, this is as far from artisan baking as you can get. If that's where they've come from, where are they now? My job is to find out. The answer might lie with baking pioneer Jason Lilly. I'm told he's as crucial to the artisan bread scene in Cape Town as yeast is to making dough rise. Just read into his menu. Sourdough, multi-seed loaf, large ciabatta, baguette, croissant. It's not out of place in Paris, Rome, London, San Francisco, New York. So what's happened, according to this, is that Cape Town's caught up. Well, I'm about to find out for sure, as I've ordered myself some brunch. This is a good sourdough. All the flavors in there, crust, strong rye in there. It tastes delicious. That's years of hard work and love that's gone into that loaf. He knows his stuff then, Jason. And the man himself has agreed to come and have a chat. Jace. How was it? Edible? Well, yeah. <laughs> Last time I was in Cape Town, they never had this sort of bread. This is quite different. This is very European. Yes. Ten years ago, we started with artisanal baking in Cape Town. There were one or two other shops in Cape Town that were doing it, but we were the only ones doing it properly. Uh, a lot of premixes were being used, that sort of stuff, and still are being used. We don't use premixes. We don't do anything like that. So. It was an education. We had to educate the people. They would come and they would say, your bread, it's going to stale in a day. And I'm like, well, there's a reason why, because it's not full of enzymes or preservatives or you know, anything. Yeah. It's pure. Four ingredients, bread flour, water, yeast, or ferment, and love, actually, five ingredients. Yeah. Sourdough starter, her name is Jessica. <laughs> and this is Henry. And Henry is now 11 years old. I started him just a year before I started the bakery. It's my best employee, actually. Doesn't talk back. This couldn't be further from the plain white loaves of the government bread days. And I, for one, am most definitely sold. But Jason wants to show me just how hip and trendy his baking is now. Wow. So we've got a few things here. They look lovely. Croissant knots. That is croissant. a croissant. And you've got and donuts you've got as well. The dough so this is, this is the croissant dough deep fried. Wow, OK. Well, cronut was taken. Yeah, yeah, of course. <laughs> Five years ago, the Cronut took New York by storm. And although the name is copyrighted, Jason has brought it to South Africa as a docent. And like so many of Cape Town's bakers, has taken it to a whole new level. We made a Verve Clicquot Rosé Mousse, which we have here, a little bit of white chocolate. We only do one flavor a week. And we've done this for the last three and a half years. Never repeated a flavor. So that's almost 170 different flavors. Wow. Inside there. Wow, oh, you're really filling it up then, aren't you? Yeah. You're not stingy with that. Then it's topped with fresh peach puree. Yet again, I'm seeing that South African signature celebration of flavour and fruit, and then even more flavour. This is mine. <laughs> <laughs> Next on, caviar made from sago, a bit like tapioca. And the finishing touch, a macaron. I reckon these docents could give any New York cronut a run for their money, but it's all in the taste. Mm. I love that because of the elements in there. You can taste it's a croissant, it's a laminated dough, but again, you're getting that strong vibe of donut as well. Yes. It's lovely, it's yes. delicious, it's really quite refreshing. That peach, the creme pat, and do you know what the killer thing is for me? You can actually taste the alcohol. You see, that for me is the future where Cape Town Bacon is going. It's forward thinking, it's developing ideas that are unique. I think Jason's done an amazing job. Thanks, buddy. Thanks okay. for letting me in. Thank you very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. I've had a flavour of Cape Town's future. Now, for a taste of South Africa's heritage. Last time I was here, I tried a traditional sweet bake I couldn't get enough of. 
and I'd like to use it as an inspiration to do some baking myself while I'm here. Ah, uh, good, there's still got some left. The milk tart. It's so popular, it's even got its own national day, the 27th of February. Traditionally, we probably know them in Britain as a custard tart, but brought over by the Dutch settlers. It's a very old recipe. With the milk from the Dutch dairy farmers here and the spices coming back from Southeast Asia, the milk tart evolved. Good crumbly base. These are rich. They have twice as many egg yolks as the Portuguese custard tart. This is much sweeter than that. They've added a vanilla to the custard to heighten the flavor, and it's like silk. But this gives me a great idea to make one my style. So, I'm going to show you how to make my take on this South African classic. I'm going to add a little bit of a British twist. I'm going to add Earl Grey to it, which will infuse into the milk and cream and give it a little bit of Britishness. Now, the milk tart is actually very simple to make. It's just a couple of little stages. You've got to make your base and you've got to make your filling. To start with, you need to make your pastry. I have my flour here, to which you're going to add my butter straight in and begin to crumb this down with your hands. You can blitz it all in a mixer, but I like getting my hands in there. You don't overwork it this way. I'm going to add some icing sugar, a little bit of sweetness in there. Then I'm going to add a whole egg. Get your hands in there and mix this together now. Then, to make sure you've got it nice and smooth, just fold it a couple of times on the worktop. OK, now pop this into the fridge. Just to chill down, just helps harden the butter a little bit. Once chilled, flour your bench. Grab a rolling pin and get rolling. It's a lovely pastry to work this. It's not too short, so you'll find it very easy to roll out. Pop the pastry into your pan, making sure you tuck it right into the corners. If you have any folds, just press them down into it, smooth them off a bit. Don't stretch it, because as soon as it goes to the oven and the moisture leaves the pastry, it just shrinks back in. And trust me, shrinkage is nearly as bad as a soggy bottom. Get your baking beans. So this is going to be blind baked now for around 10 minutes or so, 10, 15 minutes, and then we're going to trim afterwards. Always trim afterwards, not before. It makes it nice and neat. Now you can make the filling. I've gently heated one large glass of double cream and one of milk with two Earl Grey tea bags. That's going to add a lovely caramel earthiness to the custard. I have eight eggs here. I need eight egg yolks. I told you those Dutch Cape Tonians put a lot in. This is a very, very rich custard mix. Now I'm going to add my sweetness. So I've got my sugar going in, and they're going to whisk this together. Then pour in the Earl Grey creamy milk mixture. Don't introduce this when it's really hot, because this will scramble it. So you need to add it when it's lukewarm. Leave it to cool slightly, and then pour it in. Give it another good whisk, and for that super silky smooth custard, just try and get rid of some of that froth that's on the top. Perfect. And then pour this straight into your pre-baked shell. A sprinkle of nutmeg, and it's ready for the oven. This is going to bake at 150 for around 35 minutes. There you have it. Finish with a dusting of icing sugar, and you're ready to tuck in. And I'm going to take a big slice out of it just for me. Look at the way that's set. Can you see how beautifully silky that is with a nice crispy base? It's got that gorgeous texture of the custard. Then you have that hint of the Earl Grey as well. A bit of Britishness, a bit of Dutch, but all South African. Still to come. 
Wow. Very good, huh? I visited a baker who is changing people's lives with rocket ovens. Like it's amazing. And I meet a former athlete turned baker with a passion for British patisserie. Chelsea Banks. I want to be unique, Paul. You yeah. are unique. Yeah. <laughs> I'm in Cape Town, searching out the exceptional bakes, bakers and bakeries that make this city special. It's a carrot cake on steroids. <laughs> so far, it's been big, bright and bold, with bag loads of personality. I've fallen in love with you, Karen. <laughs> and I've discovered that artisan baking is alive and kicking. Today, I'm going to explore a very different side of the city's bread scene. Despite huge strides forward, 37% of Cape Town's population still live in poverty, mainly in townships. But I've heard of an organization called Bread Rev who are literally changing lives. This company has been set up for the purpose of training people how to bake. They're passing on the knowledge and providing them with these amazing, what they call rocket ovens. And that I'm particularly interested in. So, I've come to the seaside suburb of Colt Bay, where BreadRev is based, to meet the owner, Jeremy Barty. He's training a group of underprivileged and underskilled youngsters to become bakers, literally giving them a means to make a living. Jeremy. Hi, hey. <laughs> buddy, how are you doing? Hi, Paul. Nice to meet you. Good, wow. man, good, huh? I was expecting to see a bakery, if I'm honest. <laughs> what you've got here is a unit which is very industrial. We do it all here. So we've got a sample bakery behind here and then a little test kitchen through there. So tell me how this started. Well, we sort of on this mission to develop the informal baking trade in South Africa. So we started off trying to get people to bake and then realised that they need ovens. So we started building ovens. And Jeremy had to learn that skill from scratch. Basically, uh, Everyone, this is Paul. Hello. So I'm just going to show him the oven quick. As you can see in here, this is our little training facility. Yeah. If you have a look down here, there's the fire in there. Yeah. It's a box within a box. So the air goes up, hits a buffer plate, it goes round and out, oh, no, and while it goes. And then you just have a look in there and you can see there's a couple wow. of rolls and some breads. That's great. Busy baking, yeah. Where did you learn this? I basically looked for an oven because I thought, where can I find you know, something that can run efficiently, because you can put any wood in there. You can see yeah. you just put scraps. Yeah. And in Africa, the rocket is a tradition that's 300 years old. So this rocket, they actually make and put pots on and boil their thing. Mm -hmm. So the rocket technology, I thought, well, I wonder what about ovens? Mm -hmm. And I started looking around, and then I found the Americans, because the Americans love to tinker everything. And they were making rocket barrel ovens. So I thought, okay, well, I want to try and commercialize that. So that's the brief. I think it's amazing. It. Yeah. The beauty of Jeremy's rocket ovens, they not only work completely off the grid, they've been designed specifically with bread baking in mind, essential for his protégés to thrive. How long have you been doing this then? About three years ago, I built a one loaf oven out of two tin cans. And from there, it sort of grew and it was in my backyard and in, in, into a shed. And then it came here and we registered the business about six months ago. So it's quite a new business, wow. it's not, yeah, yeah. In those three years, Jeremy has made more than 40 ovens and trained over 40 bakers. And already, there are eight bread shops up and running. Economics is a very important part of our, our drive because we want to be able to be competitive. Mm. This is the high hydration dough. It's about 90%. Conventionally, most bakeries operate around 60. So when you do a lot of water in a dough, it naturally gives you more volume for your flour and therefore more bread, therefore more money when yes. you sell it. They can make 10 kilos of dough very easily, um, just a few fold tucks and a very simple hand mix. And if they sell enough, then that's enough for a good little business. Absolutely. Getting the economics right is crucial for any bakery. Maybe I can share some tips on how to add value to their produce. You can do anything you want, cuts. <laughs> and all of a sudden the bread looks much bigger and this makes it even crispier. Nice, you're learning, you see, eh? <laughs> Another one you can do is obviously anything you have lying around, like cherry tomatoes. Once you've opened it up with your fingers, put your tomatoes in, then olive oil, a little bit of salt, bake that off. They're buying a sandwich, they're not buying a bread anymore. 
you guys enjoy this? Yes. Yeah, it was Very much. <laughs> it's one of the oldest trades in the world. Mm. Baking, fishing, and tax collecting. <laughs> 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 I love the fact that he's passing on the knowledge. I love the fact that he's helping people that are worse off than him. That takes a certain type of person in the first place. But to learn how to make ovens, to bring people in to help him, and then sell them to these people to set themselves up in a business, and then teach them how to bake. Look at that. That's what you get in an Italian ciabatta. I've seen bread like that in the middle of Palermo. I've seen them in yeah. Rome. <laughs> that is to be applauded. Thank you for today. I've had, a, I've had a great time. I wish you all the success in the world. Yeah, thanks Thank you, a million, Look after yourself. Thank you, man. Take care, my friend. Bye-bye. I'd love to check out one of Bread Rev's success stories. And Jeremy has suggested I pay a visit to one of his bakers in a township north of Cape Town. So, I've got myself a hire car, and I'm picking up a guide. Do you think I should drive? Uh, <laughs> you could. Can I? No. I, no? <laughs> uh, well, how do you use these gears? So, front, up. Oh, excuse me. <laughs> you got me there. <laughs> My counterpart on the Food Network here, Siba, has kindly offered to give up yet more of her time. Woohoo! Excuse me. <laughs> Seba grew up in a township, so I couldn't be in better hands. It's very community-spirited, and we even have a word for it, which is called Ubuntu. Ubuntu being a word that means um, a place where there's humanity, humility, and just, you know, being together. It's That's, a collective feeling. It is a collective together. feeling, and it is hard, but you know what? People have come from the township like myself. We are driven. Resilient. Resilient. Resilience is a we good word. We don't crack. And no, exactly. <laughs> we don't crack. We are now in Google too. We call it Gooks. Gooks. Yep. <laughs> Sounding like a local already. Although townships fare much better than they did under apartheid, they are still the poorest communities. People here have to be creative, like Tim Bile. Should be around here. Yeah, freshly baked bread for 10 rand. A former athlete, following a stroke four years ago, Tim Bile reinvented himself as an artisan baker with Bread Rev's help and one of Jeremy's ovens. Hello! How are you? Lovely to meet you. Hello. Yes. Wow, this is your bakery. Yes, this is my bakery. I love it. It's more garage industry than cottage industry. And Tim Bile is so busy, he even has a couple of employees, and together they bake more than just bread. I fell in love with some certain products of baking, like the Chelsea buns. <laughs> mm, <laughs> Chelsea buns. Yeah. So, uh, yeah, they are not English. <laughs> they are Juju Le Toi. Juju Le Toi. First up, Tim Bile scones. Because this. Uh, it's a self raising. Ah, you, self you can buy it. I want, I want them raising you. That's a lovely scone. It's got a lovely taste to it. It's got a lovely back taste to the scone. The crumble is there. Texture is there in the scone. I'd have that with jam and clotted cream any day of the week. How long have you been baking for now? Um, three years, four years. Wow. It's only the passion. Mm. And I believe in that with no passion, your soul is asleep. Or absent. So you must have a passion to, to anything you, you do. Yes. So I bake with passion. Scones and Chelsea buns might be everyday bakes to us, but for the community here, this is really fancy stuff. They wouldn't have grown up on these bakes and ordinarily couldn't afford them. When you're making a Chelsea bun, you look for several criteria. Mm. You're looking for a soft crumb inside, mm. a great taste and a great colour. You've got all three of these. Oh, really? What I don't understand, how did you get to this level so quickly? I was a Boy Scout. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. Because in, in Boy Scouts, they, they believe that in creativity. You have to challenge yourself. I want to be unique, Paul. You are unique. Yeah. 
<laughs> and I believe I want to be more unique. Oh no, you won't stop, will you? Yeah. World domination next. Yeah. He's a natural baker. And he, he got there through very bad circumstances, but look what he's done. He's set up his own bakery. That's drive, that's ambition, and that's passion. And that, ladies and gentlemen, is what baking is all about. Thank you. Stay Take care. Take care. Bye. Amazing. Still to come. Wow. A Cape Townian dessert that exists nowhere else on earth. That's a lot of spices, isn't it? Fascinated to see how this turns out. I've never seen so many spices in one dish. And I go all out for my final bake with a barbecue pie. This is going to be interesting. I've never done this before, but we'll give it a go. My baking exploration of Cape Town is nearly over, but I couldn't leave without paying a visit to Bocap, a neighborhood that's home to a Cape Townian style of cooking found nowhere else on earth. It's lovely, aren't they? Mm. To give me the lowdown, I've enlisted one of Cape Town's top chefs, Ruben Riffle. He's got four internationally acclaimed restaurants to his name and is best known for celebrating South African classics with a five-star twist. So, Ruben, tell me a little bit about this area that we're in. Back in the day, in the 1700s, the Dutch government of the time imported a lot of slaves, um, mostly from Indonesia, India and Africa. And this is where most of the people settled. The cool thing is, this is where they still live. I think that's what makes it great, you know. These guys have managed to preserve all their traditions, especially when it comes to food. The food is known as Cape Malay, and it's totally unique to Cape Town and the Western Cape. A fusion of African, Malaysian, Indonesian, and Indian cooking. Dishes of spicy stews, curries, samosas, and rotis. One of these local delicacies I have seen on signs around the city, the Cook Sister. Hi, I'm Paul, nice to meet you. Hi, Hello. Paul, Thank, Thank you very much. much. And Ruben has arranged for a local cook, Valdella, to show me how they are made. This is the proper Cape Malay cook sister. They may look like donuts, but they are made with a lot of spices. In here, two cups of cake flour and a quarter cup of saffron rising flour. Your 20 mils of oil, your five mils of vanilla essence, baking powder, which is a teaspoon of baking powder, two tablespoons of sugar, everything of the spices are teaspoons. Okay. Ruben, you are going to add all the dry ingredients. All of them goes in there? Everything goes in there. The Cape Malacu sister, all of those goes in to give you that flavor, mm. okay? So your fine cardamom, your nachi peel, salt, and your mixed spice. You have got your fine aniseed, your fine ginger, your cinnamon, and your fine allspice. That's a lot of spices, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Wow. And now your his. Whole packet. Whole packet. You got a cup of milk. You're gonna take two tablespoons of butter into your whole milk, please. And that must melt. Ooh. Just beat up your egg there quickly. Fascinated to see how this turns out. I've never seen so many spices in one dish. Once mixed into a smooth dough, that needs to rise for one to two hours and then can be rolled into individual balls. Playing with dough. Well, that's a bit too big, OK? Is it? Yes. All right. Look at mine and look at yours. That's me told, ah, not too big doughy spice balls are deep fried in hot oil, then dipped into sugar syrup and filled with desiccated coconut with yet more spices, cardamom and cinnamon. OK, let's have a look at this. Wow. It's lovely. I love it too. <laughs> I get the cardamom straight away. Yeah. And then there's so many complex things going on inside. Spices in it in a donut-like form, but it's so different. It's so delicious, it's not oversweet. it's not just spicy, it's a very complex flavour. The texture is very soft on your mouth. That's my very first one in my life. I hope not a lot. No, I'm gonna make some when I get home now. Thank you. Because I've been taught by the master. Mm-hmm. What a fantastic woman. Everything I've tasted here in Cape Town has inspired me to bake, and I want to make something that celebrates South Africa. Now, 
I know from my last visit that one of this country's favorite pastimes is brying. That's barbecuing to you and me. We take it really seriously. We love food that's been cooked over fire, basically. My philosophy is that you can bry anything. Well, I'm about to put that to the test. We're heading to the one and only hotel, home to one of Ruben's restaurants. Today, he's hosting a party and he's letting me bake the main course for his guests. I'm going to make a bry pie. Yes, I'm going to make a barbecue pie, something I've never done before. First up, I need a strong dough. To make the dough is straightforward enough. Now, they haven't got my usual fast action yeast. I'm actually using fresh yeast. Sprinkle that in the flour, and then I'm going to add some sugar. A little bit of sweetness will help it color in the pie and keep the pie quite soft on the mouth. Salt. And then I'm going to add my liquid, which is oil and some water. Now, I'm making this dough a little bit tighter than I normally would. Because it's going on a pile, I want it to be quite a firm dough. Then it needs to be folded, rolled and stretched for a good five minutes. OK, happy with that dough. That dough goes to the side to start to rest, get a bit of air in there. This bry pie is a two-man job. While I'm busy here, outside Reuben is making the filling, a spring box stew, a bit like venison. OK, there's my dough, beautiful and smooth. Now I'm going to start rolling it out using a rolling pin, nice and gently. The whole idea for barbecue for me is all about family coming down, friends coming down, loads of beers drunk, probably a rugby game on. If this works, I might try it myself back home. I've got two pieces of dough, which is going to sandwich the meat filling in this contraption. It's all a bit ad hoc. This is the... Uh, this is a bit like a waffle machine. It goes in, and you can turn it over on the barbecue. So we'll lift this open, place this over that, one half, and I'll trim it down. Which on this thing is easier with scissors. Now, this is the spring bot that's been cooked on the bride, and it's been reduced down with wine, stock, it's got carrots in there, onion. It smells amazing, actually. I'm not going to put too much in, because I'm going to have to crimp this to seal it up so you can move it, you know? Keep it right in the middle. Get another sheet on top. Putting this thing to bed. Get my scissors. I'm giving it another trim and crimping the edges. That whole thing should go on the barbecue now. There it is, my brew. Look at that beautiful one. I like what you did there, man. It's going to be interesting to see how the heat reacts with this. It's something quite primitive, isn't it? Standing over a, a braai. Drinking a beer. With a little bit of bock in there. Have you had bock in a pie before? No. So it's a first. It is. And the only time to do it is got to be in South Africa. It's got to be a Cheers. Cheers, buddy. It's the moment of truth for our braai pie. It's all portioned off beautifully. Let's have a look. It smells good. It smells amazing. I like that. It's crispy, isn't it? It's crunch, yeah. It adds another element mm. to it, doesn't it? And that little bit there, I love that. There's something sophisticated about there it. There is. Come summer, you really got to try this at home. It's so simple. But there's one very important seal of approval I need. Hey, guys. What do you um, think? How is it going? Do you know what it is? It's amazing. Go to the try this. Let me try. It's a spring bok, oh. which has been cooked inside, um, like, a light dough. <laughs> it's hot. <laughs> <laughs> I like Love the flavour of that spring bok. But I think the idea of baking the bread over a heat. Listen, Bryce, I think. Tell him, Ruben, we can do anything baking, cooking. 
everything on a bright. <laughs> I think you're right. I love it. I love the fact that you like it. So when are you coming back? This I'm not question. going. I'm staying I'm here. Going. You didn't know that, did you? <laughs> I'm staying here. <laughs> My second visit to Cape Town has been even better than my first. It's a very special place. I think everyone should come here at least once in their lifetime and experience what it has to offer. <laughs> I've been completely blown away by the people and the baking in equal measure. Both are spirited, full of character and put a big smile on your face. From traditional South African bakes to the new kids on the block, it's a melting pot of deliciousness. It's a breakdown of many, many different things, Cape Town. And they come together to celebrate everything that's African. I love it. <laughs> <laughs>